Hope all my folks in the U.S. had a nice Memorial Day holiday last week. Well, back to the grind. So we crossed the Pacific to look at manga, and now we're crossing the Atlantic to start a new series on the other big tradition in world comics, Franco-Belgian comics, or bande dessinée. I'm all Z. I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. So bande dessinée means drawn strips in French. It's often shortened to BD or BD. Uh, it's a newish term catching on in the 1950s. Before that, comics were generally referred to as illustres. Oh, and as a disclaimer, I speak some Japanese, but I do not speak French. I will be trying my best. Uh, Pardonnez-moi d'avance. Any success that I have comes from a lot of practice and Google Translate. So, where do we trace the roots of bande dessinée? Well, part of it comes from European print culture, which I've talked about before. Check out the videos there if you want more detail. But interestingly, there's some critical disagreement about the specific generative source of bande dessinée. You might have picked up on the fact that I called BD Franco-Belgian comics, and that's because, well, there are a lot of artists working from either France or Belgian, but it's always written in French, so I will sometimes also use the term francophone, meaning written in the French language. So anyway, to the controversy. The Site National de la Bande Dessinée et de l'Image, or CNBDI, a scholarly group based in France, claims Bande Dessinée came into its own in 1827 with Rudolf Topfer. On the other hand, the Centre Belge de Bande Dessinée, the CBBD, a Belgian group, claims that Bande Dessinée began in 1897 with the creation of Richard Olcott's Hogan's Alley. So, this difference boils down to a disagreement about several things, including audience, legacy, and art. With a capital A. The CNBDI's association with Topfer is connected first and foremost to a European, and even more importantly, a Francophone figure. You may recall Topfer was a French-speaking Swiss educator. Topfer's works were published in book form, and his work was appreciated by major intellectuals as well as his students. Folks like Goethe were among his fans. The CBBD, on the other hand, places the birth of comics in the U.S., and in a popular culture context with Richard Olcott's strip. And they're not even pointing to a strip that's considered particularly artsy or intellectual like Crazy Cat or Little Nemo, but a popular one. One that is often considered the first not because it's literally the first, but because it was the best selling. And it is squarely in a mass media context. Olcott's strip was in newspapers and grew very clearly from the same satire and humor journals that were popular before newspaper strips took hold. This fight encapsulates a lot of fights within comics scholarship. For example, right up front is the issue of art versus mass media, sometimes articulated as high versus low art, and whether those two are necessarily opposing forces. Another is what format best suits the form. For example, the CMBDI's lifting of Topfer's book-published work seems to align itself with comics as graphic novels. While CBBD's support of occult privileges the more ephemeral and serial publishing formats of journals, magazines, and strips. Look, I'm not going to solve any of these fights, but I thought it was worth mentioning, in no small part because these discussions happen everywhere, and they can affect how you interpret history. And of course, how you interpret history affects how you interpret and define the present. Anyway, let's look at the specific francophone print culture that sets us up for modern bande dessinées. We've already discussed Topfer a little bit and have discussed him before, so let's look at some of the other stuff happening in the 19th century. France, in particular, had a vibrant tradition of humor and satire journals. Most prominent among them were La Caricature, a weekly satire journal founded by Auguste Audibert and Charles Philippon in 1830, and Le Charivari, an illustrated magazine founded by Charles Philippon, again, same guy, and Gabriel Albert in 1832. Philippon was a particularly influential publisher at this time. So both of these journals were founded during the reign of Louis Philippe I, who was supposed to be a more liberal monarch than his predecessor Charles X. However, Le Caricature in particular was quite critical of Louis Philippe, 
And soon, Philippon was arrested and his presses were seized. At one particular trial, his journal was accused of making a mockery of the king, saying that the caricatures were specifically drawings of the king. Philippon argued that caricatures can't be held responsible for their drawing's resemblance to a particular person, because if you look hard enough at anything, it could look like the king. And to prove his point, he drew a cartoon in which he started with the king's face, and then in four drawings, it metamorphosed into a pear. This is printmaker Honoré Daumier's more famous version of Philippon's illustration, which was published in La Caricature in 1831. Between the trial and the publication of this image, the pear became a symbol of resistance and revolution in France, showing up not just in caricature, but also in a lot of literature, uh, particularly famously in Baudelaire, uh, Thackeray, Sendall, and even in a scene in Victor Hugo's novel Les Miserables. By 1835, well, political caricatures were outlawed, so journals and magazines turned towards satire of everyday life. By the late 19th century, many of these journals became specialized for specific audiences, and in the turn of the century in particular, you see a lot of children's journals filled with illustres. And one of the seminal illustré journals was Le Petit Français Illustré, founded in 1889. And in 1893, uh, Le Petit Français began publishing a series called La Famille Fénoyard by Christophe. Now, as you can see, uh, most illustrés at this time generally featured panel illustrations with captions underneath, underneath, rather than integrated speech balloons or longer strips. Other important illustré journals include uh, Les Semaines de Suzette, which was founded in 1903 and featured an extremely popular character uh, named Bécassin, uh, and you can still actually see Bécassin around. Le Tank was founded in 1908, uh, Filette was founded in 1909, and Clichy was founded in 1911. Illustres continued in journals and expanded into supplements of newspapers, just as they did in the U.S. And in the 1920s to mid-1930s, uh, it was a period of great growth for bande dessinée and the birth of several classics, particularly Zig et Pousse, which debuted in Dimanche Illustré, the weekly comics supplement for the newspaper L'Excelsior, and this appeared in May 1925. Created by Alain saint Orin, Zig et Pousse was popular and very influential, and it was also the first comic to replace captions you saw earlier with speech balloons. Then, in 1929, the big guy hits. Hergé's Tintin, or Tintin, first appears in Le Petit Vingtem, but he's a big enough deal we're actually devoting the whole next episode to him. So we'll move on to 1934, when Paul Winkler founds the syndicate Opera Mundi. And Opera Mundi holds the rights to American comics, and most significantly, to Disney comics. So he publishes Le Journal du Mickey in 1934, and it is hugely popular, selling 400,000 copies a week, and ushers in a reign of American comics and translation in France for several years. And the big blow, of course, if you know anything about European history, is World War II. Um, of course, France suffered terribly during World War II, uh, and bande dessinée is no exception. During the Nazi occupation of both France and Belgium, American comics were outlawed. In fact, Winkler, who had Jewish heritage, fled to the U.S. in 1940, though he would return when the war was over and begin publishing again. The Nazi-controlled occupying governments of France and Belgium shut down most newspapers and, of course, their supplements with them. However, after the liberation in 1945, illustres, journals, and bande dessinée come charging back into France and Belgium. That's where we'll begin in two weeks. In our next video, as I mentioned briefly, we'll talk in more detail about Hergé and Tintin, probably the most famous creator in bande dessinée, and one of the most influential and famous comics creators in the world, even if you haven't heard about him stateside, although there's even a chance you have. We'll see you then. Illustres? <laughs>